Mm-hmm. What what um sorry to interrupt you, Anna, but like yeah. what did life look like for you eleven <laughs> years ago? What were you both doing? Yeah. You go first because yours, <laughs> yours is more interesting. I was, I was <laughs> not. I I'm not sure I was. I was an accountant, so I'm not sure that's interesting. Oh, right, okay. It was more different. It was really different, yeah. So I was an accountant working at KPMG, sitting exams. Um, yeah, and then this sort of came up, and it sort of it was it's been a sideline for years. I think we had mm-hmm. three years or so, maybe even longer. It was than five. Actually, five years yeah. between mm-hmm. having an idea and then it actually. Yeah, right. I mean, but do you yeah. remember those first like early conversations? Yeah. And were you into yes. biking yourself as well? You always Yes, but I was quite new into biking then. I right. was probably three years into biking. Yeah. Three or four years into biking at that point. So quite new into it. Like Absolutely we, loved it. We met in two thousand and seven mm-hmm. and you were just starting to ride then. Yeah. And we <laughs> incorporated the company in two thousand and nine, so it was like two years later. Yeah. Wow. Um so yeah, and at that time I was uh Blimey. When I very first started it, I was the brand manager for Iron Horse in the UK. So this was in like the Sam Hill days, um, like yeah. the heyday. So yeah. I kind of came in right at the peak and just rode the back of that for a while. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then they went bust. I don't know if everyone remembers, but Iron Horse went bust because the owner of the company had basically been like embezzling funds and stuff. And yeah. I think he went to prison. Um, but I lost my job like overnight because uh, that just happened it was like oh well there's no iron horse anymore so you don't really have a job mm. um but the guys who ran the distributor here in the uk said oh we, we don't want to let you go we'd quite like you to start a brand for us um so we'd like to keep you employed and do that but you need to move to eastbourne and i've kind of lived in bristol forestine that mm. area all my life and i was like mm, i'm not sure about that you know i'm a mountain biker and i kind of like being near the mountains Went and tried it for a while. They paid for me to come and live down there for a while and it just wasn't for me. So I quit with no job. Didn't have anything to go to other than Anna to keep me afloat. Um, got a job <laughs> in a bike shop uh, in Bristol. And then when I was working in the bike shop, that was when I was like, I just felt like I wanted more okay. uh, in life and was driving home from Avon actually one day. It had been bubbling around for years. Like me and Rowan had talked about it because we worked together at Kum Khan building the downhill track there mm. a few years before. And I just was driving home on the M4 and I was just like, this is like a gaping hole. Like, it was closest to an epiphany I've ever had. It was just like, <laughs> someone's going to do this. And like, I think that we can pull together a really good team to do this. Yeah. And it just, I've never had a such a conviction that it was going to work. And then over the years, that conviction got eroded bit by bit by bit. <laughs> <laughs> and Anna would be the one going, it will work, it will work. And me and Rowan are like, well, in the financial model, can you cut half the customers out and double the costs and will it still work? And I, was <laughs> like, okay. I was like, no, <laughs> it won't work. So when you say like about, you know, the epiphany of, of wanting to start the bike park, what did trail centres look like at that point and what was missing? Mm. There was a big problem and it still is a big problem with the model of trail centres, okay. in that the government would put large amounts of money in, sometimes millions of pounds, to build these trail centres. And then they'd be free to ride. But then over the years, they would just deteriorate and just get worse and worse and worse yeah. to the point that they just weren't fun to ride anymore. And there was no model to reinvest in them, to, to maintain them or improve them or whatever. And Rowan and I could see that. Like mm. We could see that places like Avon were awesome and then they were just like on a gradual decline and there was no way of getting funds and the government couldn't do it. It's really sad actually. Yeah, it is. You go and rewrite them now and you're like, oh, this yeah. Is, yeah. This would be brilliant and now it's quite... I guess those places do rely on just volunteer people just patching bits Yeah, up, it's, not, like, it's not like a full renovation. No, not at all. It's just, just like piecemeal and the government will find bits of funding to like rebuild bits of the trail but mm. it never would get the love that they, they deserve. So we could see that, but we could also see that the sport was evolving and that people wanted uplift riding. They wanted more challenging riding and like Forestry Commission are not willing to take on that risk, like to to sort of create much more challenging and potentially dangerous riding. And it needs to be very controlled and managed. And uh, we we were young and stupid and willing to take on that risk ourselves. (laughs) Okay. So what does the, what do those like first steps look like? You have this epiphany. Yeah, I'm I'm fascinated like, by this model. How do you then model. get this <laughs> ball rolling? Yeah, it's a funny one, isn't it? Because like I've I've had many business ideas in the past, and nothing's ever really stuck in the same way that this one has. And I think it was having the right team on board actually, 
from mm-hmm. the beginning. You yeah. know, you've got Mark, he's got like endless experience in like the industry and marketing. You've got Rowan, who, you know, set up his own company building titles. Mm. And then I came in from a financial background. So I, I ended up being quite useful in the end. <laughs> yeah. I think like w- one of the things we've learned over the 10 years is that the skills that we had as a team and Liz Rowan's wife, she came from like a construction background. Right. I don't think at the beginning we appreciated right. each other's skills enough. And I think over the years we've really learned to appreciate what we all brought to the table. I don't think it would have happened. Like No, no way. There's right. no way it no. would have happened without all of us no. having been in that. Mm. And we were lucky, really. Like, it wasn't like we purposefully crafted this amazing blend of skills that happened to be so complementary. It was just like, oh, my girlfriend happens to be a chartered accountant and Rowan, you happen to know how to build trails and I happen to have brand and marketing and sales and Liz, you have to have construction. <laughs> it was just kind of lucky. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But because of that, like whenever we went to try and raise funds, which is probably the next question you're going to have, yeah. no one said no. Every room we walked into was like, yep, we'll lend, lend money to you, we'll invest, whatever. Which is um, crazy when you think about it. Like, yeah. yeah. Um, go on. So this financial plan is based around something that hasn't happened yet, mm. though. That's yeah. what I think. <laughs> that, that, yeah. That's why I find it interesting. So you're trying to project what you think you could... Mm-hmm. How, yeah. how are you, what are you projecting? I think we we started with twenty five thousand visitors a year coming. Okay. Then you'd price it up, like what you you know how many, how much an uplift ticket cost, how much you'd pay to go and ride. Yeah, I think we even at one point had car parking costs in there at one mm. point. Mm. And then you go away and you work try and work out like what my business rates would be, how much electricity do you think you're going to use, yeah. like how much the buses are going to cost to maintain, and you run through everything you can think of, and then you. Oh, I put a whacking great contingency mm. of like I don't know what else is going to turn up yeah. at the bottom of it. But it's a hell of a model, like, yeah. it's why you need a, yeah. an accountant, because me and Rowan could have done a basic financial model, but it was very detailed, and, like, the one that we have now, oh, it's how many sheets is on it? It's like, our budget, yeah. it's yeah. like this mad spreadsheet that Anna's Hannah, created, and it's unbelievably accurate. Like, right. you can yeah. have months where she's predicted the costs and the revenues to within, like, a couple of tens of pounds. Wow. Um, you know, it's, it's yeah. super impressive. So I, th- I think the, the first one interests me the most because it's like um, 25,000 people in the year are coming to do something new that doesn't currently exist I think that's the bit that I, I find I mean that that to <laughs> me is really impressive that was the bit that was the hardest and that was the bit that Rowan and I would always be going to Anna and going you know can you try and assume it's going to be a bit worse than we think because literally just trying to survive was our our yeah. aim we were like if we make it through a year or two years you know and then we we can just make it that was the aim and we were trying to just predict like if the visitor numbers are nothing like what we imagine mm. what will happen and the reality is we just didn't know we had no idea yeah. how many people would come all we had to go off was like occasionally Jason Carpenter would run like a dragon uplift day or something like that but they were like once every few months and he'd have I can't remember maybe he had 200 people come or something yeah. like that but it was like well there's 200 people who want to come once every couple of months but we're going to be open every week like are there enough people who are into mountain biking who are going to want to come that frequently mm. we just had no idea did we no we based it off whistler numbers. oh right yeah yeah we, we had those we used f- how many people came to trail centers yeah and, it, and we looked at other places that uplifted like how many buses they run right and like opening hours and that sort of thing right so we took a whole load of all of that and then came out with this sort of figure yeah like the twenty five thousand visitors a year which we I think we saw we smashed that new one, didn't we? Yeah. 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 <laughs> how did you, like those first conversations about raising money, mm. how do you do that? Again, it's like none of us... Who do you go see? We hadn't, you hadn't done it. Like, you had loads, didn't you? You went down to chat to that chap down in um, Wales. He was like a business advisor. <laughs> down oh, yeah, in Wales. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, was, me and was that's in, funny. But yeah, that was really... We, yeah, we approached basically like our local council. Yeah. And we're like, oh, we've got this business idea and we need to raise some funds. And they put us in touch with like a business advisor, like a council funded business <laughs> advisor. And I remember, yeah, Rashad, we went to see this guy. And me and Rowan pitched our business idea to him. And I think we just blew his mind. Like he was typically advising someone who was setting up like a, <laughs> a hair salon for like one person or something. And we were talking about like millions of pounds yeah, and yeah. stuff. And I think he was just like, so he basically just kind of floated away and he didn't even sort of say i can't help you he just sort of disengaged and disappeared so we were left alone and 
like with everything, it was just literally you just dirt bagging it. Just like, yeah, let's just give it a go. Let's just think, who do we know that's got money? You know, who, who, what financial institutions can we approach? And mm. we used Finance Wales, they were called at the time, which yeah. is Development Bank for Wales. Now it's like a government, part government owned bank. So they basically will invest in probably slightly more risky businesses that they think will benefit the economy. Yeah. And they give you a really expensive loan. <laughs> like it was really expensive. Um, but they lent the money. Right. Uh, and For all of it? No. Okay. No, they, they, they lent us half a million quid, didn't they? Yeah. yeah. And but we were 26 years old and didn't have money. So we were like taking the lift down from the meeting in the bank with our Georgia <laughs> Asda shirts on. <laughs> and just like, did they just agree to loan us half a million pounds? It's like... I think Goodness, they, I think they did. <laughs> so, wow. um, how does a loan like that work? Obviously, it comes with the expectation. How is those? The, those? It, it came. Well, we all we put in. I mean, all of our money, which wasn't yeah. that much. It was like yeah. house deposit that yeah. we'd sort of been saving for at that point. Um, and then we'd also were in the process of getting grants, a massive grant from the mm-hmm. government to build it. Yeah. And that loan was conditional on the grant, so we wouldn't have they wouldn't have given it to us okay. if the grant hadn't come. With it. Okay. okay. Yeah, the grant kind of was like the the seed that drew in the other money because they're yeah. like, well, if you've got that, then this yeah. is real and you're probably going to actually do it. And and you just kind of write, I guess, I guess I, I honestly have no idea about, uh, well, probably a lot of people don't about how these like loans work, but mm-hmm. you stipulate terms on each loan. Mm-hmm. Dip to, so that can be like in 10 years' time, we want this much back or we want this much. It was much an annual repayment, wasn't it? Or? Yeah, it was. I, Going back a while. Yeah. Five years? Yeah, it was a five year term. Yeah, like a mortgage. Like a mortgage. Five okay. year term. And you pay back a set amount each. And it was double digit interest. Okay. So it, it was expensive. Because they're not all <laughs> yeah. like that, are they? they they're, no. They're literally a, an array of different. Yeah. Like. Yeah. Yes. A lot of it depends on what security you've yeah. got and yeah, how risky the bank to, thinks you are. Mm. Right. They wanted us to give like personal guarantees, but we didn't really have any personal guarantees to give. Because yeah. we didn't own a house, we didn't have any money, and it was like, <laughs> "You take the shirt off my back." But that's kind of all I've got. It's from George. <laughs> yeah. so. But I think that that was like part of like I wouldn't take that risk now. You know, like yeah. We, really, yeah, that's just been young and I've got kids and now, and like you know, we didn't really have much to lose. Of course, we didn't want to yeah. waste anyone's money or like lose the bank's money. So that was a big weight. But um, it wasn't like we had an empire to lose. You know, so. Yeah. We were willing to take that risk. I love this story. It's the dream. <laughs> it, is, yes. it is the dream. Yeah, it's it? fascinating. I mean, I, I can't help. I've always dreamt of having a bike park. Yeah. And then, like, Bike Park Wales is such a bike park. Like, mm-hmm. you turn up to it, it's like, it's on a mountain. How, how did you even find your location? Because at that point, there were dragons previously yeah. running, right? Hey, man, what an episode that was. You did amazing in it. And so did you. You shone like a star. You shone like a moon. I shone like a focus spring deal. Oh, yeah, beautiful good. transition. Right, I've got a question for you, David, to kick this final advert off. Yeah. What would you do with up to 400 euros yeah. if you got it back when buying a bike? Ooh, I could stay in the bike shop and spend my 400 euros on accessories. Good point. Support your local bike shop. Great point. I could take the 400 euros and go to another shop close by, maybe buy 400 euros of pasta, maybe go to the euro Fuse store, get 400 euros and just... That's Christmas done for eternity. True. Just keep handing them out. Lottery every year. tickets. Yeah, beans, tires, um, chamois cream, a new pet, a new pet, <laughs> perhaps a water dragon or an iguana. <laughs> yeah. Lovely idea. Well, Focus are actually making that question a reality. Nice. Because with the Focus Spring deals, mm-hmm. you can grab up to four hundred euros back when buying a new bike. If you want to find out more, check out the terms and conditions and all of the details in the link. We're going to put that below and I'm also going to read it out. Please. Okay, you ready for me to read it out? Yes, I'm... This is old school, in it? Reading out links. Yeah, anticipation. I'm going to do it anyway. Please, do it. I'm doing it. I want the deal. Ride.focus.bikes forward slash spring deals TRC. Ooh, nice. So that is ride.focus.bikes forward slash spring deals TRC and let us know in the comments what you would do with 400 euros. Best answer wins a signed O-Dub hat. 
No, I like it. Good. All I've right. got hats. Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah, I'm good okay. for that. Okay. Hey, can we also put something up here that you can yeah. click on for the next episode? How about we put a subscribe up there in the middle? Yeah, I love We're going to put a video we think that our uh, lovely companionship yeah. will love yeah. on your face. On oh, my face? Yeah. So and they on can't my, see me now? Gone. And on my face, another video that we think people will love. And thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Please hit like and subscribe. You guys are the best. Peace and love.